Um, good morning. Thank you for being here, taking the time to be here. I literally pray for platforms every night of my life to speak about what I'm going to speak about right now. I wonder what the song was, actually, because, Gary, bless you, thank you for the invitation. I wondered if it was because it was one of my Desert Island diss tracks. Is that what it was? Okay. Um, and I shall tell you why that song was important to me. I'm going to start by really sharing with you the human being that I am that stands before you today. I was born in England. Um, my father came over from India in 1952. Like many migrants, he was invited here to England to work here. He settled here, and my mother joined him later on, and we were born here. I'm one of seven sisters, and I have one brother. And we all went through the British education system in Derby, that's where I was born. And I watched the majority of my sisters being taken out of British schools when they were 15 years old to marry men they'd only ever met in photographs. They would disappear, have long, long absences, which were never questioned, and they would return as somebody's wife. I was 14 years old when it was my turn. My mother sat me down and she presented me with a photograph of a man I was to learn I was promised to from the age of eight. And I was the one who said no. I want to do my GCSEs. I want to go to college, dare I say college, because we were not allowed to have independence, freedom of thought, all those things that you normally have as a normal adolescence. Those things were deemed dishonorable by my family. Just to say my family was Sikh. Our faith was, the religious faith was Sikh. My father was a Sikh man. My mother was a devout, religious Sikh woman. And very often what my family would say to me, as with my sisters, was that we had to behave in a certain way and we had to marry who my family said because it was written in Sikh scripture, the Guru Granth Sahib. And as a young person growing up, it was very difficult to question that and challenge that because I didn't know any different. In fact, as a young person, my sister, my older sister, she used to sneak us off to Sunday school with unbeknown to my mother, three of us, and I was one of them. And we used to go to Sunday school. She would tell, tell my mother we were going somewhere else. And then we would go back home. My mother never knew that we were going to Sunday school. And I did that for two years. And my sister would sit down and pray around the bed. And, and, and I'd, you know, you'd have this kind of contradiction. We're, we're a Sikh family. And my sister's doing this in secret. Um, but anyway, when I was 15 and a half, my family took me out of education because I protested more so that I was not going to marry a stranger. Somehow it didn't sit with me. You know, this wasn't part of my culture, my religion or tradition. It didn't sit with me, but I was voiceless. So they took me out of education and they held me a prisoner in my own home until I agreed to the marriage. When I say prisoner, they locked me in a room and the padlock was on the outside of the door until I agreed to this marriage. And not, not, I was in the backdrop of having seen this happen to my sisters. So it was inevitable. I agreed to marry this stranger purely to buy back my freedom. And that meant I had to take part in all the preparations of this wedding, which happened to be mine. I ran away from home when I was 16 years old. I ran away to Newcastle up north because I thought it was a good hiding place in the hope that my parents would see sense. I was reported missing to the police. My family did find me. And at that point, the officer said to me, Ring home and tell your family you are safe and well. I won't send you back home. I begged him not to send me back home. Had he attempted to mediate with my family and send me back home, then they would have shown the officer a completely different face. As soon as the front door closed, it would have been a very different world for me. And standing on, I would not be standing on this platform. I would have been forced into that marriage. So I rang home. My mother answered the phone. And she gave me two choices. She said, you either come home and marry who we say, or from this day forward, you are now dead in our eyes. I chose the latter path, not to go back. And on that day, I can tell you this, I'd never imagined my family could ever disown me. It's like me asking you to imagine waking up tomorrow morning and never, ever seeing a member of your family ever again and being made to feel it was your fault because that's exactly what they did to me. And this is what victims go through. I became an atheist. I hated God. This is God's fault. This is religion's fault. You've done this to me. If there was a God, etc., etc., that's what I did. I attempted to take my life twice. I attempted suicide. 
And I was angry at them, very angry at my family. And I had to live this life as an adolescent who actually had no experience of life whatsoever because we were never allowed to have what you guys have out there in terms of the freedoms you have. That was wrong. We, we could be significantly harmed for that or even forced into a marriage for dishonoring our family through normal adolescent behavior. So I actually started to live my life as a 17, 18-year-old girl, very angry. And I used to have a secret relationship with my sister, Rubina. She was the one who was forced into a marriage. And my sister suffered a horrific marriage. And I used to say to her, leave your husband, come to me, I will look after you. She would say, it's easy for you to say that, because you don't have to think about mom, dad, what people think, and the honor of the family. She was absolutely right. I was an outcast. I was cast out, disowned by my family, this horrible human being that wasn't even worthy of the breathing the air, my mother said, that exists in the, on the planet. And as a 22-year-old at that time, my sister was 24, I was a market trader. I left school with no qualifications whatsoever. And this woman came to my stall and told me to ring home because something terrible had happened to my sister. So I rang home. My mother answered the phone. And there she was telling me that my sister Rubina at 24 set herself on fire and committed suicide and she died. I remember on that day being even more angry at God at my family, at the world. Somebody had taken their life in such a horrific way. My family were very clear. It was better for her to take her life than to her to leave her husband. Is this tradition? Is this religion? Is this part of culture? What is this? And being at that, that crossroads yet again of what do I do here? I'm feeling so unloved and lacking self-esteem and anything that made me feel worthy of anything. At that point in my life, I made the decision to come out of hiding because I lived in hiding for many years out of fear of what my family were capable of. And I went back to my hometown in Derby. And I made a decision to start speaking about these crimes, be it forced marriages, honor abuse, to speak out because I fundamentally believed that I was one of many. And I was doing it in anger, I was doing it because I was angry about my sister. There was no hand on me guiding me at that time, I didn't think. And I was just doing it on pure energy, let's say. Bloody mindedness, let's say. And I went back home to my hometown, not home. And back then, when I was 27 years old, for the first time in my life, I read a book. I'd never read a book in my whole life. We were never encouraged to read. My mother was very clear that where you were going, there was no need for an education. So I read a book for the first time in my life. I did my A-levels. I did a degree. I, I completed my degree. And I got a first, actually. Um, and for the, I remember being at the Student Vote of Thanks and being asked to speak at the Student Vote of Thanks and to give thanks to all the people that were there. And I remember being in Derby Assembly Rooms. This is the first time ever God had given me a platform. And I was still an atheist completely. And I took the platform. And looking out at the audience, my children were on the front. No member of my family was there. And speaking from the heart and talking about what is a reality for me and for many people. And, and how an education wasn't a privilege, it wasn't a right for me, actually. It was something that was taken from me. And that platform for me, when I spoke, I felt as if I was speaking for many people at that time. I did, wholeheartedly did. And it becomes real, does it not, when you speak from the heart, when you actually just say what you think and feel, and that what you think and feel is actually something that other people are also feeling. They don't even have to be experiencing what you're experiencing, but compassion enables you to feel that. So I set up Karma Nirvana in my front room. Karma Nirvana means peace and enlightenment. In 1993, I was still there working. This charity was in my front room, literally. In 1997, I was pregnant with my son, Jordan. And still, at that time, I had no love for God whatsoever. 
and I was working, campaigning, etc. I was hurt by the fact my sister wasn't here and people thought it was right for her to take her life. And at that time when I was pregnant with my son, my friend Sharon, her name was, used to come to my house and pray over me. And I used to say, okay, pray over me. No big deal, just do it. Because at that point, I was living in a bed sit with two children. I was barefoot pregnant. My husband had left me for another woman. That's where I was in 1997. And she used to come and pray over me, and I was pregnant, losing weight, always in hospital, etc. She'd pray and pray, and I, and I used to look forward to her coming to pray, but I never told her that. And she would come, she'd place her hand on me, pray over me, and she gave me my first Bible. And when she'd gone, I would start reading it. And there were certain passages that would speak to me, and they would just put me at peace and ease. And it actually enabled me to sleep, actually enabled me to eat, and something was happening, and, and Sharon would talk to me. I gave birth to my son, and then in 1998, I did the Alpha course. Still going in as somebody, I don't believe this really. Did the Alpha course, doing things, and I started to think, and the dots joined up. You know, we're, we all have a purpose, every single one of us. And when I look back at my life, I began to realize you know, in my family, I was the only one born in a hospital, the only one born upside down, my mother used to remind me, the only one that questioned things, the only one that said no to a marriage. My sister did it, well, they did it without question. That doesn't make it right. They were still vulnerable. But maybe God had his hand on my life before I was even born. And that's what I was beginning to think. Maybe Rabina, bless her. Her life had to go in order for me to wake up and come back to my hometown. You know, even the most tragic events happen for a purpose. And I fundamentally believe that. Because had she not died, I would never have gone back to my hometown and become a campaigner. And I began to become thankful for my life and the things. Even disownment became easier. And the biggest thing it taught me when I did find my faith was to forgive and let go of my family. Because while I was holding on to all that anger and all that hatred, my life was on hold. And, and that, for me, was a huge relief to let that go and say, you know what? Forgiveness does not mean being foolish. It means letting go, accepting that never the two shall meet, but you are free of it now. Mentally, and physically. And that's exactly what I did. And that actually opened a new world for me in terms of me being able to do the work that I was doing. Because I did it with a different level of compassion and faith. Every day, and I do not profess to know my Bible back to front. I don't. But I'll tell you what I do do. I put on the armor of God every single day. Every day, I pray as I open my day and close my day with my children. And that armor actually enables me to be an effective campaigner. Because I can tell you, as somebody who campaigns against forced marriages and honor based violence, in the last 20 years, I have sat around tables with more people that disagree with me than agree with me. And that's a fact, and it still is a fact. And I would go in and just sit there and smile as if I had a gift. And I do have a gift. Lord, make these people a footstool. They are enemies, but make them a footstool. So make me somebody who is able to hear their disagreements, their frustrations, etc., but equally to overcome them. And there was a boldness, still is a boldness within me. And I started to own the fact that I'm a child of a king. And Lord, I want you to use me as a vessel to do your work. And I say that every day. Put me on platforms where I will be heard, where I can speak about these issues. And I took that, I take that with me everywhere. And sit me with the head, not the tail. Those decision makers who have the power that you've put them there, you've put them there. And on those travels, I have worked with and met the Prime Minister, Barack Obama, various people, talk to them about these issues. And you know, when I, when I meet them and I work with them, people say to me, oh, you've met, and I say, you know what? 
You have the power to meet these people because God has given you that power. It's not a big deal. It's not. You make them accountable to what you are saying. Because, you know, it's not about me meeting them. It's about the voiceless. And that's what you're taking to them. And you're bringing it to their attention. And as a campaigner of 20 years, let me tell you, David Cameron last year said, because when I hear some of these politicians, whether you like politicians or not, they are there. You know, they are a democracy. We're in a democracy. They are there. And they are accountable to us. I hear some of these politicians, and they are reading scripture. They are, without even, you know, I, I hear them. You know, the blueprint for advocacy is the Bible. As far as I take that with me, I don't have to shout about that. I take it with me wherever I go. But they are also speaking the same language. And you, if you just step back for one minute and listen, you will hear them. Make room to hear that. Make room to let go of the disagreements and to make your power known to them. And, and, and David Cameron, last year, as a campaigner of 13 years, I've been campaigning for a criminal offence of forced marriage. We have no criminal law in this country to tackle forced marriage. Last year, he said, the campaign of Jasmine de Sanguera, it's not my campaign, it's the Lord's, has turned my head on the issues of forced marriage to the degree where I will criminalise forced marriage. And it will become a criminal offence next year in April. That is, that is, that is the power of God, using me and many others as a vessel. Where you see obstacles, they are an opportunity. When you walk closest to God, let me tell you, you have the worst time, and we know that. I don't need to tell you that, but it's an opportunity. But how many of us can truly say that we actually believe that, that in faith, we can actually give that to God and say, Lord, this is really tough, but I'm giving it to you. And actually mean that. Because I can tell you, in 20 years as a campaigner, there have been many times when we've had to almost close the charity down because we haven't had the funding. There's been many times when we haven't been able to afford to go and speak about this issue. But you know, in faith, we carry on. Because where there is purpose, and God is using you as a vessel you'll be provided for. Without a shadow of a doubt, you will be. So we have a criminal offence. And, you know, for me, that is, by the grace of God, going to make such an impact in terms of what will happen with respect to opening the lives of the most vulnerable people and giving them the opportunities they deserve. We launched the National Helpline in 2008. It started off in my front room, back in the days. And... That helpline over the last three months has received 30,000 calls from people in the UK calling the helpline asking for help. You know, and this is, this is the power, is it not? And now the law means professionals will also start to own this and shift their minds, etc. And one of the things I say to God, I say, Lord, because, you know, we know in politics, and I say politics because a lot of my work is working with these people to mobilize them into doing the right thing without having to think about themselves and the vote. Because people like myself and others are raising their head above the parapet about an issue that is not talked about. But that's the voiceless, is it not? You know, isn't that where Jesus walked? And now, you know, from my perspective, when I think about my days and what I'm doing. I say, Lord, please give me the power and sit me somewhere where I can make a greater difference. That's what I want. I want to be able to use what I have to make a greater difference. And, and albeit do it silently. Because when you are making a difference, you do it because you fundamentally believe in it. It's not about me. And next week, I, 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 I'm not blowing my trumpet. Please don't think that. I want to tell you the power of God. I, say, I am receiving a CBE for, for work to victims of honor-based violence and forced marriage. When I receive that, I'll give it to God. And I will say, Lord, please help me to use this to help further the cause that I'm on here. 
because those accolades, whatever you want to call them, should be used for a purpose. And, and that, for me, and I can tell you, even from it being announced, shifted things in terms of people mobilizing them. And it's sad to think that, but that's how it is, in all honesty. So, my faith, to me, is something I clothe myself with every single day and night. I'm nothing without my faith. And when I work, when I speak, and I speak at many events, I take it with me. When people ask me, I am very bold and tell them about my faith. I don't put it in their space. I'm being quite frank with you there. There are opportunities that we know and we present ourselves. Sometimes I meet people and I just know, you know somebody who walks in faith and you share it with them. But whatever works is important. That's what matters. You know, I have three children. Um, my daughter, Natasha, was married last year. And all my three of my children walk in faith. And, and, and last year, Natasha had the big, fat Indian wedding. Because for me, in my experience of disownment, and I'm still an outcast as far as my community are concerned, but this is my community, and God is my father. And that's all I need. She married, she had the Sikh wedding, and she had a Christian wedding. Now, one would say, how is that possible? But it's possible because you know what? Cultural acceptance does not mean accepting the unacceptable. Tradition is beautiful. I divorced myself from my culture, tradition, because it was too painful. Uh, you need a family to share those things with. And I have found that the journey has taught me that my faith is my rock. But there is space to embrace other cultures, other communities, other religions. And what I find is, on my journey, part of me rubs off onto them. <laughs> and that is really important. And that you are true to that. Because ultimately, that is where the significant change lies without you even knowing it. And wherever you speak, if you leave a mark, then that means you're going to be making a difference because then other people will go off and speak the same language as you. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. For the